Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Ragbir Kakar, and I'm hosting today's um, evening for Orthopaedic Specialists. It's a real honour and pleasure to introduce my um, colleague, Stefano, uh, Dr. Stefano Palmasani. Um, it's always great to have um, uh, members of our team. Really, um, we're not ex experts in, and we always refer to for help. So if, I, if I'm ever in trouble with uh, patients who are in chronic pain, um, I've got the right person to go to. Um, today's talk's entitled, finally, a stim stimulating talk on pain. We're gonna look at neuromodulation for chronic pain, what it is, evidence, and who to refer. So as I said, um, I'm really pleased to introduce Stefano, um, who's an expert in chronic pain and neuromodulation. His main interests are around interventional pain medicine with a focus on minimally invasive endoscopic spine intervention. Um, he has got a proven track record in research and innovation. His background is actually in anesthesiology, in anesthesiology and he went into pain uh, medicine thereafter, um, doing his research and innovating in this area. Uh, he enjoys an MDT approach, working with uh, multiple health specialists. A whole host of different um, backgrounds. So Stefano, Stefano works with lots of different people to try and uh, pay, manage pain uh, with the patient as the central focus. Um, he's widely published in peer-reviewed literature and he le lectures and teaches in the area all around um, the globe. He's part of the team for orthopedic specialists. Um, we have a, a whole host of orthopedic surgeons, um, maxillofacial surgeons um, and uh, pain specialists who can, who can help you out if you have any um, issues that you'd like us to have a look at. We're based out of the Harley Street Specialist Hospital. This is based on Queen Anne Street. Um, uh, it's, uh, we have our own theatres there, as well as the day case unit, uh, which allows us to do these procedures. And uh, we also work in close conjunction with the London Clinic. Um, so tonight's work, uh, what it is, how it works what the indications are, and a brief review of the published evidence and who to refer. And there will be a questionnaire that follows this talk. Uh, two, P two CPD points have been awarded. And um, if you wish to follow what we're doing uh, on social media, uh, Stefano is on ResearchGate as well as LinkedIn. So feel free to look up orthopedic specialist Stefano uh, on LinkedIn. We also have our Twitter handle at orthopedic specialist. And these are our contact details. So feel free to take a picture of this slide uh, if you ever need to get in contact or have somebody you'd like us to have a look at, or even come and visit us and see exactly what we're, what we're up to. So I'm not gonna take up any more uh, time. I'm gonna hand over uh, to uh, Stefano. Um, so I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, just before I hand over, just to say guys, if you have any Stefano, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Ragby, for your presentation. Just before starting sharing the screen, can you can you hear me okay? Because uh, when you were talking, my connection, I'm not sure whether it was my connection, a bit sloppy or yours. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Perfect. Okay, so let me start sharing the screen. So uh, here we go. And then let me see if I can start this. Here we go. Can you see my screen right? Perfect. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Rugby has already introduced me, I, I work as a full-time consultant in pain medicine. I'm based at Geisers and Thomas's NHS, and then I'm working with orthopedic specialists uh, privately. What I'm trying to focus today is uh, to describe you what neuromodulation is, why why we actually need to be, you need to be aware of neuromodulation, what is the evidence around it, and what are the referral criteria that every neuromodulator would like to have in terms of patients referred to, right? So first of all, why are we all interested in chronic pain? I mean, this is uh, nothing new. The prevalence in UK for chronic pain uh, varies between 35 and 50%, according to one of the latest British study. And uh, the, the prevalence is also depending on the age. Clearly, in the um, a group population of uh, 60 years old, uh, the, pre the prevalence reach way over 40%. 
Now, the question is, why are we talking about neuromodulation? Well, if you look at uh, NICE guidelines and what is available and approved or suggested or recommended for chronic pain, uh, there is nothing much. If you look at the low back pain and sciatica guidelines, if I zoom it for you, you see that after physical therapy and some pharmacological treatment, there is a radiofrequency denervation, which is a percutaneous technique. Uh, but besides that, there is nothing else. And actually, uh, NICE uh, recommends not to offer uh, further invasive treatment like spinal injection or some spinal fusion. If you look at the NICE guidelines or pathway for neuropathic pain, you see again that uh, it doesn't recommend besides some medications, nothing much besides uh, spinal cord stimulation, which is the main form of neuromodulation. If you then uh, read even better, I mean, in, in, in August 2020, NICE uh, put out a draft uh, recommending not to use most of the common chronic pain drugs to treat chronic pain, which is a bit of a paradox. But if you read it, they, uh, they don't want now even chronic pain specialists to offer opioids, non-steroidal drugs, benzodiazepines, and antiepileptics, including gabapentin, uh, to treat chronic pain. So in reality, there is nothing much left besides neuromodulation. Uh, neuromodulation has been assessed by NICE, uh, both in 2008 and in 2019, and is uh, one of the few treatments that uh, has been supported and recommended by NICE. If you can see, I've listed all the other ones here, and you see that there are some that are not, not recommended, some of where there is a potential use, but uh, the only ones that are really recommended and supported is neuromodulation. Now, what is neuromodulation? On a, if, you, if you look at the, uh, if you Google the definition and you look on a, on a dictionary, uh, neuromodulation, the modulation is defined as the ability to use a, an, an electrical signal uh, to superimpose the signal on top of another one to modify the baseline one. So if you apply this concept on modulation of the neural activity, this is what neuromodulation is. We are trying to use electrical impulses to modulate the neural activity of some nervous nerve structures. Now, technically, it, it is not a, a difficult procedure. Uh, it is a percutaneous approach to uh, the epidural space, which means that we are using a needle to insert a, an array of contacts inside the spine in what we call the epidural space. Uh, we keep it posterior, the lies on top of uh, the dura, and underneath the dura, there is the spinal cord, which is the target of the, of the therapy. Now, as you can see, I mean, from the video, it is just uh, inserting and threading up uh, a multi-contact array uh, inside the epidural space. That can be done in the thoracic spine, that can be done in the cervical spine, according to the pain etiology. The, the, as I said, the technique is quite easy, is uh, significantly safe. It is reversible. Uh, if it doesn't work, the leads can be removed without having created any permanent damage on the cord or on the spine. Uh, there is a possibility of performing a trial of therapy, which means inserting the lead and deliver the therapy and asking the patient whether the therapy is actually helping or not prior to implant the old device that consists in a lead connected to a pacemaker-like battery that we usually insert in a subcutaneous pocket. The other interesting part is that uh, being a, a, a therapy that, relate, that is based on a technology, technology, as you know, uh, advance extremely fast. So every year we get new gadgets, new devices that provide, or at least they promise us to provide better pain relief um, to our patients. Now, why the spinal cord? So I don't, I don't want to clearly, I don't want to discuss the mechanism of action of uh, spinal cord stimulation in too much details. Uh, first of all, because we are not entirely sure of every single bit of this equation, and also because it's a bit outside the scope of this lecture. But um, we are stimulating the spinal cord because within the spinal cord, and more specifically within the dorsal horn. There are the small processing, sta processing station of the pain signals. They're coming from the periphery through our, with this uh, afferents that you can see, um, let's say with the 
green line, right? These are peripheral nociceptive afferent that ends up in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. What we do, we use a, a known uh, anatomical passage between the dorsal columns and the dorsal horn. These are the big yellow dots to inject some current within the dorsal horn. It is quite well known that chronic pain, it is almost a pathology of the dorsal horn. The dorsal horn is not able to filter out pain signal as it does usually in people without chronic pain. And using this electrical signal injecting in the dorsal horn, we try to modulate the area and try to restore the ability of the dorsal horn in filtering the pain signal. Now, talking about the, the evidence, is there any evidence around this treatment? Now, if you put a spinal cord stimulation in uh, PubMed, you see that there are more than 3,500 papers. But then if you, if you look at when these papers have been published, in the last 20 years, most of the papers, papers have been published there. And even more, in the last five years, half of the paper has been published. So there is a significant drive of the industry in, and of the clinicians in publishing more and more uh, literature around spinal cord stimulation because it's a significantly effective therapy which is not well known in the majority of the uh, clinical settings. Now, these slides is quite old, but it does give you an idea of uh, why spinal cord stimulation is becoming more and more widely used. Here on, on the x-axis, you see a pain score, 10 being the worst pain and zero being no pain. And you see the reduction of pain score using spinal cord stimulation in multiple trials, both randomized trials, prospective trials, or res retrospective trial in multiple indication with patients having chronic back pain, chronic leg pain, uh, chronic back pain without having had previous spine surgery, uh, upper limb pain, and peripheral neuropathic pain. So this is just to, to introduce the concept that the therapy is effective and effective in multiple different etiology and pain location. Now, I'm proud of being part of a very big neuromodulation group in London. Uh, and we have been the first one uh, in Europe to pioneer new waveform of spinal cord stimulation. So you can see that the a small box on the left-hand side is the paper that we published introducing higher frequency spinal cord stimulation in, um, in Europe. And that then was led with, uh, was then followed up with a randomized trial in US. And we have been also the first one to pioneer the idea of treating people with chronic back pain rather than with spine surgery with neuromodulation. And that was the first open label and proof of concept study that we've published. And now that is, uh, um, is followed up by two different randomized controlled trials, one in Europe and one in US, that yet to be published. So the question then is, uh, what, what is the indication? What, what are the patients that could benefit from spinal cord stimulation. Now, there are different ways to present it, what could be the, 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 the right etiology. I thought it would be nice to present one of the, the, the study that we, again, recently published in my, in, in, in my group at Geysers and Thomas's in London, where we look at the, the last uh, two, almost 1,200 implants that we perform in the last 11 years. You can see that 50% of the patient implanted had previous spine surgery, either in the back or in the neck, uh, that resulted in persistent pain, either the back or the neck or the upper or lower limb. 20% uh, of the patient had a condition called complex regional pain syndrome, which is a quite well-known condition that affects uh, either the lower limb or the upper limb, usually hands or feet, uh, where there is a neuroinflammatory disease that uh, cause uh, significant pain and sympathetic changes in the extremities. Another 10-15% of patients had back pain, but they never had prior surgery. You see that there are also a small percentage of patients that had nerve pain, they had head pain. We are a big center for headache and migraine, and we do use my a spinal cord stimulation for that as well pelvic pain, neurogenic bladder. So as you can see, the, 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 the common theme here is having persistent pain in the either the upper or lower limb, uh, having had a previous spine surgery, 
having had complex regional pain syndrome or having had some form of uh, neuropathic pain with nerve dysfunction. Now, of course, that is just the, the type of patient that we have implanted, but there, were, there are many randomized trials that have been published where uh, the evidence is analyzed and presented in a more scientific fashion. So as I was mentioning before, one a, a very common indication is what has been called like failed back surgery syndrome, which is a horrible term. Let's say people had spine surgery and they still have pain. So what we call it more persistent pain following spine surgery. These are subject with chronic lower back pain and or leg pain, where mechanical pain generator tends to be excluded with significant disability. So we use ODI to measure disability and they are refractory to conventional medications. Now, um, these are, it's not just a definition of failure back. This is the, the major inclusion criteria of the biggest randomized control uh, trial on of spinal cord stimulation in this category. This has been, is a company sponsored trial where 160 subjects were randomized in having either a spinal, conventional spinal cord stimulator or a new waveform spinal cord stimulator. Is the, this is a very first randomized controlled trial in the field with active control, is the biggest one in the field, and has led to both the NICE support and FDA approval of those devices in US. Now, without boring you with too many graphs, uh, I mean, you can see that there is a significant reduction in both cohort of patients. Both of patients started with pains, back pain score around eight over 10, and both of them had a more or almost 50% reduction throughout 12 months here. But then these patients have been followed up for 24 and now even 36 months. What also you can see that uh, conventional simulators, so the old ones, the one that have been implanted for the last 20 years, provided usually 50% pain relief. Uh, and also 50% pain relief in 50% of the patients. So on the left-hand side, you can see the gray line, reduction from eight to four in terms of pain score. And on, on the right-hand side, you can see the percentage of responders, defining a responder, a patient that had 50% pain relief. And you see that conventional stimulation usually gives you 50% pain relief in 50% of the subjects. Now, new stimulators, like well, the one that I tend to use with our high frequency stimulators, they reduce the pain score by almost 70%. And that happens in more than 70% of the patients where the therapy is applied. So we are now getting in this new era where we can offer 70% pain relief in 70% of the patients treated. Now, these are just numbers, right? But then if you look at individuals, so each one of these bar represents the decrease in back pain from baseline for every single patient of the trial. So this is a life-changing therapy because you see that there is a significant amount of patients where there is 70, 80, 90% of pain relief with virtually no pain at all. So this is the very first time where we can present data that shows that patients, every single patient has a significant relief maintained over time. And it's not just the pain scores, right? Uh, these are data regarding the opioid consumption, that it is a huge problem in US, but it is also a significant problem in, um, in, in UK as well. So you see that there is a significant reduction in opioid consumption. We're using here the morphine uh, equivalents, but uh, you, there are different ways to present the data. You see that in Europe, uh, patients tend to abandon opioids when they, there is a significant efficacy of another treatment more than in US, but there is a trend in reduction in US as well. And on the right side of the, of the screen, you can see that this is quite consistent, not just in this big randomized controlled trial, but also in many other small prospective study, they are actually uh, um, targeting different type of, their, uh, of etiology, not just uh, back pain following spine surgery. So there is at least 30, uh, from 30 to 50% of the patient that decrease significantly the opioids and this, or stop it. And it's not just for back and leg pain. So recently published in Neurosurgeries, which is another significant big journal, another prospective study where the same treatment has been applied in the neck for patients that had upper limb pain or neck pain. 
you see the etiology is quite mixed, but what is predominant is patients with neuropathic pain, so radiculopathy, and degenerative disc disease, half of which had previous cervical spine surgery without resolution of the, 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 of the symptoms. And if you look at the, at the same type of graph that I've presented before, in the neck, we, we tend to have even better results. Pain scores drop from seven to one or two. Uh, responder rates are now way above 75%. At 12 months, you, you reach 90% of a responder rate, which means patients with more than 50% pain relief. And if you look at the tornado plot, where you can actually see each single patient, how much pain relief they got, the majority of them, they are way above 80%, virtually, I wouldn't say virtually pain-free, but significantly improved. And it is not just the back and neck. So I don't, I don't wanna bore you with kind of a, a meta-analysis of all the studies on diabetic neuropathy, where spinal cord stimulation was applied in, in patients with uh, neuropathic pain in the lower limbs due to uh, advanced diabetes. And you see that there is a significant reduction in pain scores, very similar to the one that you saw before in the previous slides, and is consistent and maintained over time. When, so you see this, this huge amount of people signing this paper, these are probably the, the most authoritative uh, uh, authors in US, Europe, and Australia that joined together to sign up a systematic liter literature review on spine neurostimulation, uh, just recently published in Pain Medicine. And uh, they have analyzed the biggest five randomized trials. They, they, they have highlighted that now conventional spinal cord stimulation is a very well-established treatment for uh, chronic pain that is more effective for pain relief than a reoperation in patients with previous spine surgery that is more effective than conventional medical management in the same category of patients. The new type stimulator with different waveforms have um, might, may provide a greater chance of getting pain relief. And then nowadays, new stimulators that uh, do not produce any noticeable sensation, what we call paresthesia, are to be preferred, both in terms of better pain relief and in terms of better quality of life, since now these new stimulators are working in the background without providing the patient any sensation like the old one were used to do. Some people have um, kind of complained, saying that what we are doing is a very expensive placebo or sham surgery. So, and again, I've quite proud of it, to have been part of a couple of studies, the first three on the top, where we tested this uh, kind of therapy against sham, has been tested against placebo as well. And there is a significant now evidence that this therapy is more effective than placebo. I mean, for people that are familiar with forest plot like this, you can see that anything that cross the zero line without breaking it, so being completely on the left-hand side, should means that from a statistical perspective, the active therapy is more effective than sham or placebo. So it is now quite well established that this treatment works, works significantly well for most of the patients and is not placebo. Now, it all is well when you, when you talk about randomized trials, but what is the, the, the real world data? Again, there are many, many studies that have shown real world data for spinal cord stimulation. I, again, I'm gonna use our own since because I'm quite familiar with the data. You've seen the type of patients is a huge uh, amount of patients putting in this database. And I wanna, I wanna focus on a couple of graphs that I think are quite important. One is the uh, number of explants of devices caused by loss of efficacy. This is what we call a hard outcome, means that if the, it's difficult for a patient to tell you exactly whether they have 90%, 80%, 70% of pain relief, but it is quite evident if the patient requests a removal of a stimulator because it doesn't work, well, then you can say that that, that, can't, that patient has failed the therapy. There, we have an explant rate 
between 11 and 15 percent at five to six years, which is significantly good considering that those patients are refractory to conventional medications and to other form of surgery. And that is more or less maintained uh, for the up to eight, nine years. We, we, we don't have data more than that. And the therapy is quite safe. One of the worst uh, complications you can get is an infection of the system, either the battery or the lead implanted. And, and you can see that the explant rate cause because of the infection it stays between two and 4% throughout the, the years. And besides the first blip, the first 1%, which is caused by probably an acquired infection during the surgery, most of the other infections, unfortunately, are not related to the surgery, so they are not preventable. Now, what, what is the, 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 the best candidate? So what is the best patient that can be referred for a consideration of SES? You've seen the etiology, right? So we've seen that people with back pain, people with leg pain, neck pain, arm pain, CRPS, or neuropathic type pain. But it, it is not that easy. And that's why it's important to have a, an expert neuromodulator assessing a patient prior to uh, discuss the surgery. So this was a consensus of, I think, more than 25 expert neuromodulator where, uh, you, where, where they were presented different clinical scenarios, chronic back pain, CRPS, neuropathic pain, with different pain location, different type of pain, and different abnormality to either the MRI scan or the EMG. And they, were, and they were asked to rate whether according to them, that specific patient in that specific clinical scenario, it was appropriate or inappropriate for a spinal cord stimulator. So what you can see, and this is what we currently do when we see the patient in clinic, patients with lower limb, so radicular pain, are more likely to respond and they are so are more appropriate patients. Patients with neuropathic type pain are an appropriate candidate for this kind of technology. Patients with nociceptive pain or patients with spinal instability, patients that have a mechanical pain drive, pain generator for their symptoms are not appropriate candidate for this. And it's funny because I, I did a, a very, very quick search of uh, uh, my, the last two and a half years of practice in my NHS. All the patients that have been sent to me for spinal cord stimulation, they were candidate for SES, but they were a suspected pain generator. When you start and doing some diagnostic blocks, perhaps in the sacroiliac joints, or in the facet joints, you see that 40% of those patients do respond to the block, their pain disappears, and those ones are not good candidate for stimulation either. And then there is the problem of psychological phenotype that can blur the picture. You know, chronic pain, it is not just uh, a, an electrical, an abnormal electrical signal. There is an all sort of psychosocial um, confounding factors that can generate, maintain, or exacerbate the pain signal. So here we have just listed most of the common uh, reason why a patient could be psychologically inappropriate uh, for a spinal cord simulator. Patients that do not engage in any form of therapy, they, they, they have a dysfunctional coping mechanism, they have total unrealistic expectations. So doctor, please, I want my pain gone, completely cured. Patients, they, are, they have absolutely no daily activity uh, level, so they are completely bedbound. Patients that don't have any um, social or family support. Patients that have secondary gain, so there are some um, additional factors for which they want to still be uh, in pain. For example, in UK, benefit or patient with psychological distress or mental health problems, which paradoxically is the less of the uh, of the worrisome psychological uh, yellow flags. And of course, patients that are not happy in reducing the high dose of opioids, since we know that high dose of opioids uh, might actually induce chronic pain and definitely uh, do not help uh, the, the symptoms in general. Now, um, the, the, 
the field of spinal cord stimulation is, as I said, is advancing, not just in terms of technological advancement, but we are trying to expand the field of uh, what could be treated. Uh, you've seen that the evidence uh, suggests back, leg, neck, and arm pain, and complex regional pain syndrome and neuropathic pain. Uh, now there are uh, prospective study uh, where chronic abdominal pain patients with uh, no, no abdominal pathology um, or with known pathology that affects uh, neuropathic nerve, nerve issues, including uh, chronic pancreatitis or intra-abdominal adhesions or uh, gastroparesis, all those patients do benefit from a spinal cord stimulation. There are a couple of uh, prospective studies that are in, uh, in, um, in publication. Um, and peripheral polyneuropathy is another new field where uh, patients not only uh, report significant improvement in their pain scores, but they also report uh, improvement in their objective uh, uh, sensory uh, profile. In other words, the patients with sensory deficit start to regain some uh, sensory function because of the therapy. Now, uh, I'd like to, um, to present a specific case that goes well beyond uh, uh, all the evidence that I've just presented to you. And this is because I want to show how life-changing this therapy could be. She has consented to, for me to present a case and to show pictures and videos. So she, she is a, a young lady that I saw her a couple of years ago, and she was referred to our center as a third opinion from north, I think from up Liverpool, with uh, a... V2, V3 post-surgical trigeminal neuropathy. She had a wisdom tooth extraction four years, well, at that time, four years ago. She developed jaw osteomyelitis, requiring multiple surgery to the bride, the area. And she ended up with allodynia on the face. She couldn't touch the face. She couldn't open the mouth. For the last two years, she couldn't eat and she was forced to feed only with a straw. You can see, see the spec, spec CT scan with the osteomyelitis in the, in the jaw. And you can see from, this was the intra-op video that the anesthetists took because they were doing an awake intubation. She wasn't able to open the mouth more than that. And when I asked her, can I touch your face? She reported or not, please do not do that. It is quite in, 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 striking that uh, after the surgery, just in the recovery room, she was able to open the mouth. She was able to touch her face. This just using a spinal cord stimulator lead that was inserted to stimulate the, the trigeminal nu nucleus caudalis. When the pain is really neuropathic, it does respond extremely well to stimulation. She's now, I think three years or two years down the line, and she's pregnant so much that one of the anesthetists asked me whether they can do an epidural for labor. And she, she's now able to eat normally and she, she's basically almost back to her normal life. So I, I, I think that in these uh, 20, 30 minutes, I, 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 I managed to give you a, a brief overview of what spinal cord stimulation is and how does it work and what is the right uh, candidate that could be referred to us. But I'm very open to, to, to answer to all your questions. I mean, it's a very broad field in terms of uh, indications. Uh, and therefore, I'm pretty sure that you guys will have some questions. Thanks, Stefano. It was a riveting talk. I certainly learned a lot um, from that. Um, there are some questions. We've got Peter Jenkins in the audience who, who's asked uh, specifically, um, with the neck pain study, 45 out of 100 failed the screen and were excluded, why, why did they fail? So there are, let me, let me get you the slides back, right? Um, uh, let me try at least. So there are different reasons why patients uh, fail. Uh, here we go. Okay, so the main uh, 
failure at prior to the trial phase is uh, mechanical pain generators. So this therapy does not substitute spine surgery. If you do have a mechanical pain generator in your neck, the spinal cord stimulator will not help. Usually what we do when patients comes with a neck pain, even if he had previous spine surgery, we do a series of diagnostic blocks. So if the pain, especially axial neck pain, responds to a diagnostic block, that is a, a negative predictor of efficacy of a spinal cord stimulator, and the patients needs to be directed to a different therapy. So most of those patients were excluded because of mechanical pain in the neck. Some of the patients were excluded because of psychological uh, issues. As I said, most of those patients needs to undergo an MDT uh, where there is a, an implanter, there is a, a psychologist, and then there is usually a spine surgeon if we're talking about back and neck pain. So most, some of those failures were mechanical pain and some of those failures were uh, psychological failures. Stefania, from, from me, obviously, with a lot of these pain issues, it's quite multimodal. What sort of different specialties are you closely allied with to work to try and get these patients through their chronic pain situations? So in the ideal setting, right, you would like to have a, a patient that is, that is referred by a, a specialist that has already excluded mechanical pain generators, which most of the times is not the case, but uh, that's what we, we use. So if it's back and neck, we have spine guys. If he has neuropathic pain, we do have neurologists with us. Uh, then you want to have a psychologist to help you screening all these psychological yellow flags that I did show you before. And, and, and usually you would like to have those patients engage in some form of pain management programs prior to the therapy as the therapy is a, is a significant help in reducing their pain scores, but it doesn't do anything in improving their, uh, their attitude towards the chronic pain. It doesn't do anything to increase their, in, to increase their um, uh, activity levels. So all these things needs to be addressed either before the stimulation or soon after the stimulation. Otherwise you will not be able to reach the same kind of uh, uh, outcomes that I've shown. Okay, um, Karen uh, Tunan um, has asked, when the leads are implanted in the back, are there any restrictions in motion and load of the back? So in the, in the short term, yes. In the long term, no. In the short term, uh, it is a percutaneous technique. Therefore, the anchoring of these leads is extraspinal. We do suture them on a supraspinal ligament uh, and we then uh, wait for scar tissue to form around the entry point of the lead to avoid the leads to, be, to move. So for the first three to six weeks, we advise the patient not to uh, um, not to do increase rotation or flex or extension of the spine so that the lead stay become stable. After that, we have patients they are diving or they are riding or they are running. Uh, we had some patients that did, did skydiving, but in some of those, the lead did migrate. No surprises there. Um, so uh, David and Tabby's asked, um, is the HF applied continuously or intermittent? How do you decide oh, sorry, on which I, way from I, 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 I didn't hear you very well. Can you sorry, repeat? Sorry. The question was, is the HF signal applied continuously or intermittently or on demand? Okay. How do you decide on which waveform to apply? Okay, so to, for, the, for the first question, so HF, the high frequency stimulator, but in general, spinal cord stimulation has been traditionally applied continuously. Now, this is because um, the common knowledge at that time was that uh, if there is an abnormal processing in the dorsal horn, then you need to have a constant injection of current there to modulate it. Now, in the, la in the, in the last like four or five years, there have been studies showing that in reality, you can duty cycle the energy delivery in there. So you can have few seconds of therapy on and few seconds of therapy off, and you might have the same relief and in some patient even better. So in some patient, we do tend to overstimulate and that 
let's say, uh, reduce a bit of the efficacy of the stimulation. Now, the other question is how to select the right device that it might take three days to answer. There are five or six uh, spinal cord stimulator company and they all uh, try to market their own device. My personal preference is to go with the evidence. Wherever there is a randomized controlled trial, I listen to that company and I try their therapy. Some companies have invested significant amount of money in producing clinical efficacy data. Some other companies just using uh, their, um, let's say, uh, pool of implanters without producing real science. And that's why I have chosen to use few selected companies. Newcomers, there is a new uh, company that I've started using that uh, rather than just stimulating the spinal cord is also collecting electrical activity from the spinal cord to tailor this, the, 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 the therapy to the reaction of the cord. And they have just published a trial in Lancet Neurology. Those are the type of uh, devices that I think are worth to be explored because there is evidence around it. At the end of that question, David also asked, is there an element of habituation of the stimulated area, therefore refraction? So this is a, a very good question. In the last year, we have been talking about habituation for, for, for a while. The problem is that so far, without having any uh, measurements of what is happening on the cord, we do see 10% of the patient, as I showed, that in the long run fail to respond to the therapy, despite a very, very good trial and a very good pain score reduction at the beginning. And we think that that is habituation. Now, whether that is habituation to the, to the signal is a situation to the location of the stimuli that could be moved up or down, or could be a, 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 some form of a micro damage to the dorsal columns there we are stimulating, and therefore they do not conduct the electricity efficiently down to the dorsal horn, is extremely difficult to know. It, it is also known that, especially for back and neck pain, these, these patients do have degenerative pathology. So they might develop additional symptoms that are not the original ones. And then, and then what we think is habituation is simply a new pain generator that needs to be explored. Brilliant, some really good questions there. Um, fantastic. Look, Stefano, th thank you so much for such a great talk. I really appreciate you taking your time out this evening to deliver that to us and to all the participants who've made it this evening. Um, I hope you found that really useful. Um, if you do wish to um, get some help from, um, from, from us, uh, we'll just include our details here on the final uh, screen. Uh, so where you can find our details on orthopedic specialists on our website, there's the email. Uh, do not hesitate to get in touch. Um, as you know, uh, orthopedic specialists, we run um, a webinar every two weeks um, and we will be hosting our next one very shortly, which you'll get an email about um, and the themes vary um, each time. So well, thank you once again for coming along and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Goodbye. Thanks, Stefano. Thank you, thank you very much, Rugby, for inviting me. And thank you, everyone, for listening to me. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye. Have a great evening.